Hello, everyone, and um, thank you for joining our Akoya Academy. This is our 2021 inaugural edition, so happy 2021. In today's webinar, we're going to speak to you about how autofluorescence reduction can improve your codex workflow. So this webinar is for our codex users, and we will show you how you can get make your, both your experiment and your data better. My name's Oliver, and I'm going to start this webinar by giving you a short introduction into autofluorescence and how you experience autofluorescence in your codex experiment. So there are two types of autofluorescence that I would like to talk about. First one is on the left-hand side here. This would be fixation-induced autofluorescence. So most, probably all of you know that fixation of tissue actually is, triggers the um, uh, autofluorescence. So autofluorescence is a direct consequence of aldehyde fixation. And you can see this very, very clearly in this image here on the top left. So this is kidney tissue. And what we're doing is we're imaging this kidney tissue. It has antibodies on it, but it has no fluorescent reporters on it. So there's no, no fluorophore on here. And we're um, illuminating this with a GFP channel. So this is a low wave ramp low wavelength imaging experiment. So you can see there's all kinds of detail going on in this image. You can see cells, you can see bright spots, uh, potentially a vasculature object. None of this is actually labeled. This is just autofluorescence. So you can see there's a lot going on. You don't want any of this to be here. And you don't want this stuff going on here. This is autofluorescence is something you don't want in your experiment. So fixation induced autofluorescence is certainly a problem. On the right side here, you have a core of a TMA that contains lung tissues. Now this image is a finished um, image. That means it has several imaging channels merged and they're assigned pseudo colors. Now normally you would see collagen in yellow. You can see little areas of collagen here, but you also see this massive yellow golden area in the, mid in the middle of your core. Turns out that these are actually erythrocytes for blood cells. This is not collagen. So these are specific elements or discrete structures within your tissue that are autofluorescent very strongly. We don't want to see erythrocytes in this experiment, yet they are the most prominent feature on the image that I'm showing you here. So without saying much more, it's pretty clear that autofluorescence is problematic and it shows itself in many different ways. And it would be really good if we could deal with this in, in, in many ways, because the less autofluorescence we have, the better our experiment gets. So the way that autofluorescence is dealt with today with codex experiment, for those of you who are doing codex, and who are processing codex data, we have a very good background subtraction. So this is a digital way of removing an autofluorescence, and this happens after you acquire your image. So let's take a look at this. So in its native state, your tissue this is a fixed brain slice that you see here. This is unlabeled once again with um, fluorophores. You can see all kinds of really bright specks and spots on here, as well as some degree of background fluorescence in this brain tissue. That's what raw autofluorescing brain tissue looks like. Again, there are no fluorophores on here. That's just what this tissue looks like after fixation. This is the GFP channel. So this is a low wavelength recording. Now, if we also um, go on to the next cycle in our codex experiment, and here you can see now the GFAP antibody, you can see when arrows are popping up here, these little yellow arrows are showing you glial cells. Glial cells are what we want to see. They label with GFAP. At AF488, that is our reporter dot. This is your result. However, you still have a lot of different specks, little um, pieces of autofluorescence all over this tissue. You can see two examples with the red arrows. So what happens in your codex experiment is you take your actual signal image, this is this middle image, and you subtract the background image, which is the one on the left. And as a result, you get what you can see here on the right-hand column, your background subtracted image. You can now see in this image much clearer of your glial cells as indicated with yellow arrows. Um, and you see the signal to noise is overall much better. Your background is almost black. However, there are still many little particles left and you can see them here with red arrows as elsewhere throughout your image. So while the background subtraction is a very powerful tool, and it indeed helps you to increase the signal to noise ratio of your image. It's not perfect. There are still 
too many artifacts in your tissue. There's still probably in other types of tissue, there's still gonna be sort of a baseline level of background fluorescence. So the question arises, how do we get rid of this autofluorescence? How can we improve our experiment so that our data in the end become better? And that is the topic of today's webinar. We're gonna show you how to implement a simple autofluorescence removal step in the lab. And we're gonna then walk through some data analysis that show you that indeed an improvement occurs. So I'm gonna tell you um, no more than this. And instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass um, control over to my colleague, Cassandra Hempel, and she will speak to you how to implement this protocol in the lab. Hi, my name is Cassandra and I'm a research associate at Akoya Biosciences R&D. Today, I'm gonna to talk with you about the implementation of autofluorescence reduction in your codex workflow. The autofluorescence reduction protocol readily fits into the existing codex FFPE staining protocol. If you're unfamiliar, you can actually download the protocol on our website at acoyabio.com slash support slash reagents. So you would typically start by selecting your tissue type and then sectioning that tissue onto cover slips. Then you would move on to steps such as slide warming, de-waxing, and antigen retrieval. And then you'd continue with your tissue staining and fixative steps. Today, however, I'm gonna focus on the autofluorescence reduction protocol, which will fit in between the antigen retrieval and tissue staining steps. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. After your antigen retrieval, you'll cool your tissue down for a brief period and then start by washing your tissue in PBS for three minutes. Now I'd like to highlight that throughout the entire codex protocol, as well as this autofluorescence reduction protocol, the tissue is submerged in solution the entire time. Now this is important to note because if the tissue is dried out at any point, this is actually going to increase your autofluorescence and background. So that's something that is important. Um, so while you're in these PBS washing steps, you can make the, uh, the bleaching solution. You're gonna want a final working solution of 4.5% hydrogen peroxide and 20 micromolar sodium hydroxide in PBS. You'll need enough of this solution for two five milliliter wells in your six well plate for each tissue. You'll start by putting your tissue in one well for 45 minutes and then move your tissue to a fresh well for another 45 minute incubation. The entirety of this 90 minute incubation will be subjected to the LED light. Once that's finished, then you're gonna continue with, five, with four PBS washes for five minutes and then continue with your equilibration in the staining buffer and then your three hour antibody staining. Now, we're very confident with this protocol. We actually, in conjunction with internal testing, have had several people externally test this as well. Um, this is a separate protocol from the existing codex staining protocol, and you can request this protocol by emailing support at acquiabio.com. We'd like to formally recognize Derek Oldridge and Jonathan Bellman at UPenn for their development and contribution to this protocol. So now we'll move on to the setup. So this is the LED light device. Um, you can get these LED light boxes on Amazon like we did. Um, you can see in this left picture here that the LED light boxes fit on your bench space and they don't take up too much space and they will fit in any typical outlet. And in this middle image, you can see that we do use the six well plate that you use for existing codex protocols. And the LED light boxes go directly over top and directly beneath the six well plate. This is a very easy setup. And I would like to point out that it is important that because the LED light boxes are directly touching the six well plate, you don't want these to heat up. It is crucial that these don't heat up at any point during those 90 minutes. So actually what we did in our lab is we turned them on and let them sit for 90 minutes and then felt them to make sure that no heat would reach the tissue before we did our experiments. And I would re recommend that you do the same as well 
That way, your tissue is also not affected by this. So now we can look at some of the preliminary results. Okay, so this is a highly autofluorescent lung cancer tissue. And I'd like to start by just talking about this autofluorescence again. So you can see in this top left panel that this is epithelia. Um, there are actually no reporters or fluorescent dyes on this top left image. This is purely the innate autofluorescence and background of the tissue itself. And it's a beautiful tissue, but this background can be distracting from the actual signal that you'll get from your signal from your marker expression. So if we look at the top right panel, you can see that I have applied pancytokeratin. And again, you're seeing these epithelia with the pancytokeratin expression, but you're also seeing this background and even tissue abnormalities such as these. Now, I took a serial section of this tissue and imaged the same area, except I applied the autofluorescence reduction method. And in this, top, in this bottom left panel, you can see that this is still the same region of tissue, but the background and autofluorescence are virtually gone. And then when you do add the pancytokeratin, you can still see this beautiful epithelia, but you're not confused or distracted by any of the background. And as you can imagine, if this is something that's happening just by looking at the tissue, it's also going to confuse the software. So we're actually going to dive a little bit deeper with that with my colleague, Basem. So he's gonna talk about that now and I'm gonna hand over control to him. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Bessem, I'm data scientist at Aquaria Biosciences, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the quantitative evaluation of the autofluorescence reduction protocol. I'm going to start my presentation with an example of a human FFP, uh, human brain tissue. As a human brain is known to have like a high autofluorescence, in this example, we took two FFPP human brain uh, serial sections, and we ran two uh, separate codex experiments. The codex experiment looks uh, like, this, like this, where we have four channels, uh, each different uh, fluorophore. We have 16 cycles, and where the first cycle is a blank, cycle where we don't have reporters we just like imaging autofluorescence in the three last channels and same for the last cycle and we usually use this blank cycles uh, to subtract the background of the images acquired with uh, antibody um, just want to mention that the first channel is always uh, dappy and is used as a reference uh, channel that we use also for uh, to align all the cycles uh, of our experiment. So first I'm going to show uh, a blank image acquired with GFP in the VF GFP channel without autofluorescence reduction. And as you can see here, we have uh, high, very high intensities of background. So like, keep in mind, like we are imaging this image without, we are not looking to any antibody here or any uh, reporter with just imaging autofluorescence. And then in the same channel using the same length, the same exposure time, but with uh, G, uh, GFAP antibody, uh, we can see additional uh, information in the image, which like this, all this astrocytes that we are seeing here, but we can see that there is very high um, correlation with uh, the blank image, which is uh, the, the, the background of, of the GFAP image. And here we have a correlation of 70, almost 70%, 70 which is considered very high. And you can see on this image to the right, uh, all those speckles, very bright. And, but the, the good news here is that our background, sub segment, uh, background subtraction algorithm is still able to extract those astrocytes from this image by removing the background found in the blank image from the GFAP image. But as you can see here, we, are, we still have like some um, pixels that are bright, that's coming from the noise that we have in the background. Like for example, like this dot here, which is just 
high autofluorescence, uh, autofluorescent pixels. And to measure this, we can draw a line on this image and we measure the intensity in each, each pixel uh, along that line. As you can see here, like this high peak here, it corresponds to this astrocyte. There's another high peak here, this second astrocyte. The, this are the branches that we are seeing here. This is this astrocyte is like this high peak in the middle. And using the signal, we can set up threshold to define our real signal versus the noise and calculate the signal to noise ratio using the mean intensity uh, of the signal to the mean of the background of the, of the noise. And now we are looking to this, we are looking, we will look to the second section of the tissue, which is, uh, with, but with applying uh, autofluorescence reduction. As you can see here, we are looking to the, exactly the same tissue to with the same uh, GFP channel, the same uh, wavelength and exposure time, and the, how the autofluorescence is much lower uh, when we do uh, autofluorescence reduction. Note that all these images here are saturated at exactly the same intensity. And when we look at the GFAP image, it looks also very different as we don't have all those um, all those high autofluorescence structures that, that we were seeing earlier without autofluorescence reduction. And if you calculate the correlation, uh, earlier it was about 70% without IF reduction, but when we see, when we look at to the result with a autofluorescence reduction, we get much lower correlation. And that's actually what we want. We want our image that is acquired with the antibody looks different than what we the, the background the background image. So our correlation we want to be to be lower. And when we do the background subtraction again, we get our uh, uh, this image here. And as you can see, we have we lost those uh, high intensity small points that we were seen there. And if we measure again the signal to noise ratio, or we look at first like the intensity is occurred, occurred along this line, we can see that all the background that we are seeing here is mostly flat. It's like the values, they got very, very low. And all the peaks that we have, they are just like correspondent to the real signals. And if you measure the signal to noise ratio, it's here to 28 and here it's 11. So it's like three times we get three times higher signal-to-noise ratio with autofluorescence reduction compared to without autofluorescence reduction. So now we are looking the same tissue, but with uh, for different antibody and uh, different channel, which is CY3. Uh, what we are seeing here are the uh, blood vessels. As you can see in the blank image, they, the middle, the inside, the inner part of the blood vessels have high autofluorescence. And then again, when we do background substruction, we still can get extract those blood vessels, but you can see that there is there is still a lot of noise in our image. It's not just composed of those blood vessels that we, we are looking to extract from this image. And um, while compared to when we do uh, autofluorescence reduction, it's, we have our uh, blood vessels more distinct, distinct from, from their background. And the correlation goes down dramatically from 92% to, to 10%, which is very great. Um, and then when we measure the signal to noise ratios, we have uh, four times higher signal to noise ratio compared, like when we do IF reduction compared to when we don't. And as you can see here, like the noise is super flat. We only have those uh, two or three peaks of these two blood vessels. Uh, and then now uh, we will look at the same uh, <clears throat> thing, but with the CY, in the CY5 for the synapsin antibody, you can still see all the improvement between the background image with and without IF reduction. Uh, for this channel, the when we do after the fluorescence reduction, the background is 
almost completely gone. And again, like all these images are saturated by the same intensity. Here we are almost not seeing any background. And the correlation here goes from 30%, 31% to 0%. It's almost, almost negative. And the single to noise ratio measured in the same way with using uh, line profile is um, two times uh, bigger. And actually, we can see this on also all the other markers. It's very consistent across all the channels and uh, antibodies. Uh, we can see if we, uh, when we look at like the second channel, third channel, fourth channel, we can see that the correlation with the background is always lower when we do autofluorescence reduction. And that's very consistent across all the, all the antibodies. Here I want to mention that in the DAPI, we are seeing all the correlations um, close to one, and that's actually a very good sign because uh, it means that our cycle alignment worked very well. And because the, in the DAPI channel, we are like with the first channel, the DAPI channel, we are always imaging the same, exactly the same thing. We are imaging with the DAPI and we want those images to look exactly the same. As that's our reference, it allows us to align our cycles. So this result is actually very good for to show for the for, for the DAPI and for the cycle alignment that is working very well, and also for the background uh, for the correlation with the, with the background that gets much much lower. So now I'm going to take another example of uh, FFP human lung tissue, which is also the lung tissue also known to have high autofluorescence. But in this example, we have used exactly the same antibody, but in, uh, in different, uh, different channels. And I'm going to focus for this presentation on the CD20. So if you look at CD20 for G in the GFP channel, we can see with no autofluorescence reduction, very, very high uh, background here. All the, the few, like the intensities that we are seeing higher here, they are like the, the CD20 positive cells. Um, and when we do autofluorescence reduction, we can see our background gets lower, but in the, this time not, uh, we, still, we still can see some background. But again, our like, if we calculate the correlation, it goes from 80% to 40%. So it lost like uh, half, half of the correlation. And uh, we can see that our extracted image from the background subtraction looks like we have higher intensities for the CD20 for those B cells and our single to noise ratio doublet. This is another example. Again, like looking at the same uh, field of view of the tissue with for the CD20, but in a different channel, which is CY3. With the CY3, you can see like the background uh, intensity decreased even better than uh, the, uh, the, the GFP channel. And our single to noise ratio, well, here our single to noise ratio didn't actually increase by a lot, but it's also because like our background subtraction algorithm work very well in both um, cases with and without IF reduction. But even though the single to noise ratio didn't increase by a lot, we can see that the correlation actually increased by a lot. We can see that the correlation went from almost 40% to, to, to less than 10%. And here we are looking also again to the CD20, the same tissue, same region, but with the CY5, as you can see as now for the CY5, we have always less background, goes even less when we do IF reduction. And the correlation also goes lower from 7% to 1%. Signal to noise ratio is, is double when we do autofluorescence reduction. And we can always see that like the noise here gets like becomes flat on, on this profile. And this is actually still consistent also for the lung through for the other antibodies like pancytokeratin or CD31. It's always lower when we have auto, when we do autofluorescence reduction. 
And also we ran the same experiment for kidney FAP tissue and uh, tonsil FAP tissue, and we are always seeing uh, the same, uh, same result. Always the out of us, the correlation using the, with the, of each antibody image, the corresponding background, when we do out of fluorosis reduction is lower and we get our signal to nose ratio better. Thank you everyone. Now, Nadia, uh, my colleague will lead the talk. Thank you, Bassam. My name is Nadia Nikolina, and I'm Senior Application Scientist in Marketing Group at Acquia Biosciences. Today, I will be presenting the summary of our findings and provide recommendations to correctly implement autofluorescent reduction protocol in Codex workflow. On this slide, you can see our recommendations on correctly assigning your barcodes without AF reduction protocol as well as with AF reduction protocol. If you plan on using uh, AF reduction protocol, you will have an option to use Alexafluor 488 for FFPE tissues. If you're wondering that is it really possible to use Alexafluor 488 on high out of recent FFPE tissues, the answer is yes, of course. You will see in the next slide the results of using Alexafluor 488 on FFPE human brain tissues. On this slide, I'm presenting a few examples of using Alexafluor 488 on FFP human brain tissues. The top row provides the examples without using AF reduction protocol. And in the bottom row, I'm presenting a few examples using reduction protocol. Let's look at the first example showing vimentin staining. We used the exact same antibody, but the difference between these two images are different fluorophores, different exposure time, and different brightness and contrast settings to visualize our staining. Let's look at the second example showing um, alpha smooth muscle actin staining. Again, we used the exact same antibody, but again, difference between these two images, different fluorophores, different exposure time, and different brightness and contrast settings. Now let's look at the last example on this slide showing GFAP staining. Unlike the previous two examples, since now you have the opportunity to use Alexafluor 488, you can reassign your antibody to a different barcode if needed. In this example, showing that we reassign the barcode for GFAP and use corresponding reporters with Alexafluor 488. Additionally, the other difference are exposure time and the brightness and contrast settings to visualize our staining. In this slide, I presented codex images for different markers with and without AF reduction. On the next slide, I will present a few more images for codex markers with zoomed in views. You should not be afraid to use AF reduction protocol. Based on our observation, it would not impact staining quality. And on this slide, I'm presenting a few examples of codex images for three different markers with three different fluorophores that were used. GFAP with Alexafluor 488, Lamine B1 with out of 550, and NUN with Alexafluor 647. In the first example of GFAP with Alexafluor 488, on zoomed in image, you can see extremely fine structures of astrocytes. You can see astrocytes process is very clear. And you can see definitely that this fine structure was not impacted by AF reduction protocol. In the next example, flamine being one with out of 550. Again, on zoomed in image, you can see high quality staining of nuclear analog. You can see each single cell on this image, and the image quality is really good. The last example is NUN with Alexafluor 647. NUN is neuronal marker, and you can see again high quality images showing complete morphological structure. 
In this slide, I'm presenting examples that you have already seen earlier in the quantitative analysis portion of this presentation. You can see significant improvement after reduction protocol, particularly in this example on FFP human brain tissues. We would recommend to try this protocol for tissues with a high autofluorescent background, but please keep in mind that you may potentially need to optimize the protocol on tissue by tissue basis. You can optimize some of the AF reduction parameters. For example, you may need to optimize LED exposure time. Overall, in this webinar, we presented how to reduce autofluorescence using modified codex staining protocol and the effects of AF uh, removal on codex imaging data. If you're working or you're planning to work with a tissue that have very high autofluorescent background, don't refrain yourself from using codex. It is absolutely possible. And thank you for your time today. Thank you, Cassie, Basim, and Nadia. Um, it is now time for um, some Q&A. I would la um, ask all of our listeners and viewers to post questions that you have. And if you do so, please do in the Q&A function of the Zoom chat. Um, this is how we can see them. And that's our best guess, uh, your best shot at getting them answered. Uh, once again, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of our Zoom window and post your questions in there. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. So I'm gonna start with the first question here. And it's actually a combination of different questions. I think I'm gonna post this one up to Nadia. So Nadia, there's a combination question. The first is, was this protocol only tested on FFPE samples? What about fresh frozen? And then the follow-up for this question would be, do you um, recommend the photo bleaching to tissue before or after the antibody staining? Nadia, take it away. So we actually have never tried uh, fresh frozen tissues because um, we were trying to focus on FFP because obviously for FFP tissues, it's the biggest problem, but I don't see any reason why it should not work for fresh frozen. Um, so question regarding when we are implementing uh, for the bleaching protocol, it's before uh, antibody staining. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nadia. Um, the next question here is um, a question that I will quickly answer. And the question here is, could you please tell me who to contact for the exact protocol? And are you planning to implement it into the user manual? Um, so this protocol has been posted um, by Akoya. It's been available through um, support at akoyabio.com. So you can write them an email and they will send it to you. This is a customer developed protocol. Um, we've developed it together with collaborators at UPenn. Um, it's been around for a while and we have quite a few users who are already implementing this. So you can request it at support at akoyabio.com. At present, there's no plan to Im Im implement this formally into our user manual. It is really a suggestion. It's really a protocol that we, um, we give to people. We, we recommend people use if they have really highly autofluorescent tissues. Uh, you know, a lot of tissues, a lot of people use this um, the, the codex experiment without the need for any further background um, fluorescence reduction. In that case, you don't really need to use this. So this is sort of something you use when you're working, for example, with a very autofluorescent lung or kidney, then that is useful. So we don't want to implement it to the main protocol for that reason. It shouldn't be universally necessary. Okay, so um, I have another question here. I'm gonna um, send this one over to Basim. So this um, question here is um, relates to your myelin or your GFAP staining that you've shown. And the question is, what if you're interested in myelin signal? I suspect that refers to the fine processes of astrocytes. The algorithm, the background subtraction seems to remove the myelin as well. Basim, can you elaborate on this? Uh, I, th I think the question here is, is not just about uh, the autofluorescence reduction or not, because we can see like in both cases, the myelin uh, signals, they are not very clear. But actually also, if we um, 
saturate the image like uh, at lower intensity and we zoom on the images we can actually still see a few few of those uh, uh, mail in signals in, in both cases so yeah, okay. it's, it's not. It's, yeah, it's not related to the background subtraction. It's just like the signals they are actually low for those very thin uh, strings. And yeah. So I think it, it, it's really also a matter of how you mute the image and how you how um, you mute the saturation. So um, overall, I think probably the background subtraction has a harder time at, at discriminating was right and wrong if, if you have really high background. That's just the nature of these algorithms and reducing background is always a good idea. So I think that may be why this appeared to be um, um, truncated in some cases. Okay, thanks Basim. Um, moving on to the next question. Cassie, this is for you. Um, why do you need to use an LED light in the incubation? Um, so the LED and the bleaching solution combination seem to have worked best. Um, I would recommend this because it's a combination of the photo inactivation as well as the, ble the bleaching. Um, and this is how we tested it. Um, and as well, our external customers have tested this as well. Um, so this is what we would recommend doing. Great, um, that sounds um, like a great um, answer here. Thank you, Cassie. Uh, I'm just reading through all these, there's a lot of different questions here. So I'm gonna take a question that is sort of a combination of questions that people are asking here. And it pertains to the um, question whether or not um, the autofluorexins um, reduction will affect the binding of some antibodies. Um, so we have not found any difference in the overall um, appearance of staining, we haven't found any difference in the ultrastructure of cells that we're looking for. Example again is are the GFAP cells, the astrocytes that we have shown. So we do not have any evidence from our lab that it affects the staining of the antibody. The protocol is derived from uh, a method that was published by Peter Sorger's group. So if you obtain the protocol from us, we're happy to send it to anyone. Again, um, you can get the protocol from support at acoyabio.com. Um, if you get the protocol, we have the citations for the protocol in there. Once again, it is from Peter Sorgo's lab. And this um, technique is used in other cyclic immunofluorescence applications uh, repeatedly, actually. So in, in, for example, in Zycif, which is another way to do high throughput multi or ultra high plex immunofluorescence imaging, they use this protocol over and over and over again on the same tissue. We only use it once, um, one between the fixation and the antibody step. So we assume it is quite safe. And once again, we have no reason to believe that it changes the antigenicity or lowers the overall labeling. We did not see any of this. So thank you for that. I'm gonna read through some more questions. I think we have time for two or three more. Just gotta go through and pick them. And then anything else we will probably answer. So I wanted to ask uh, Cassie once again, how long does the um, protocol take in total? So if you implement this protocol into your codex workflow, what will be sort of the overall increase in time? So the staining protocol with the autofluorescence reduction added will take approximately nine to 10 hours. Since this is a longer protocol, we have adopted performing the antibody staining step overnight at four degrees. Great, thank you. Um, and here's another one for you, Cassie. So um, there are several questions regarding the use of other types of autofluorescence reduction agents, such as true black or sodium borohydride or, or other um, chemicals that people use to reduce autofluorescence. Um, do we have any good feedback on whether or not people should use them or have we tested them? So, for these, um, we haven't tried the true black or true view. Um, some of these other quenching methods are not compatible with our chemistry and our fluidics delivery system. Since it is cyclic, um, things such as true black 
um, can leave a stain. And we recommend not using anything that's going to leave a stain. Okay, thank you. So I have two last questions here. Um, one goes to Nadia, actually. Um, Nadia, which tissues have we tried this on? So we tried this protocol with um, FFP tissues, with FFP human brain, uh, FFP human lung, renal cell carcinoma, and we also tried with synovial tissues as well. Okay, and then a follow-up here. Um, really a lot of questions coming in. This is great. Um, let me just ask this one. Um, did we have any experience with tissue loss during the implementation of this step? For example, has this complicated our experiment and then we noticed mm -hmm. that tissues were floating away? No, we didn't experience um, anything like this so far. Okay, so I'm going to wrap this up now. Um, we have to close here um, at the a quarter of the hour. Um, I would really like to thank everyone who has participated and can, can, who, who came to our webinar. The webinar will be available on demand on our website. Um, you can go to a Koya Academy link and it will be on there. You can revisit it anytime you like. And once again, um, the protocol should be available to you at support at akoyabio.com. All the info on how to implement it should be in this protocol. Uh, we also have links to the original citations and it should really help you to answer a lot of your questions. So with that, we hope you've learned um, something new today. We hope that some of you may find this protocol useful um, and we really would like to thank you once again for your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next um, iteration of Okoya Academy webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>